Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric Bach, and I would like to welcome you to my talk, in which I will introduce an empirical model for stagnation pressure gain in rotating detonation combustors. This work was funded from the Aerospace Research Program of the German Ministry of Energy, and I would also like to acknowledge my co-authors Panagiotis Statopoulos, Christian Oliver Pascherait, and Miles Bauer. Rotating detonation combustion is a promising implementation of the pressure gain combustion concept and has the potential to significantly increase the efficiency of state-of-the-art combustion systems for propulsion and power generation. In an RDC, a detonation wave continuously travels around an annular channel as shown in this animation. This process is sustained for as long as fresh reactants are supplied from the head end. At the aft end, high enthalpy product gas exits the combustor. RDCs have high power densities and constitute a harsh environment for any instrumentation. Additionally, the flow is highly unsteady and fluctuates in the kilohertz range. This clip from our lab shows a six second run at approximately one megawatt of thermal power. Quantifying the actual gain in stagnation pressure from the air plenum to the exit throat and identifying its main drivers is paramount to assessing and comparing the performance of RDC designs. Kemming and Paxson therefore proposed a method based on equivalent available pressure or EAP which uses isentropic relations to obtain the stagnation pressure from thrust measurements. Assuming that the RDC outlet is on average choked over one detonation cycle, the pressure gain can be expressed simply as the ratio of EAP to plenum pressure. This method was tested numerically and experimentally with RDC designs spanning a range of injector area ratios and outlet throat area ratios. Both were found to play a key role in the calculated pressure gain. Brophy and Codoni also defined a practical region of interest for these parameters. But other drivers do exist. Propellant mass flux as a measure of thermal power, the equivalence ratio as a measure of available chemical energy, and the operating mode that embodies the dynamics of this device. In the present study, we will focus on the two area ratios and mass flux. In order to provide a broad data set for modeling pressure gain, we conducted a systematic study with the 90 mm RDC at TU Berlin operating on hydrogen and air. This radially inward design allows for easy variation of the air gap height and the outlet restriction, simply by exchanging different plates in the setup. We chose a unique approach by placing a keel probe in the exit plane to directly measure stagnation pressure of the high enthalpy exhaust. This probe was 3D printed from a cobalt chromium alloy and has been used successfully in thousands of hot fire tests. The mass flux available in this facility spans a range between 50 and 300 kg per second and square meter. At stoichiometric conditions, this corresponds to 0.3 to 1.9 megawatt of thermal power. Overall, we studied four different air injectors with area ratios from 0.14 to 0.46 and five different outlet restrictions from fully open at 1 all the way to 50% locked. We are going to be looking at the results discriminated by the air injector pressure drop and outlet blockage for a mass flux range of 150 to 300 kg per second and square meter. Below that, it cannot be ensured that the exit is fully choked and thus the measured stagnation pressure is not meaningful. Looking at the smallest air injector, we can see that the pressure gain increases with increasing thermal power. If we now also increase the chamber pressure by further restricting the outlet, 
the pressure gain also rises. Comparing these five curves to those for the other air injectors reveals the beneficial influence of decreasing injector pressure drop. While no positive net gain was recorded here, the best case approaches a value of negative 8%. This is promising considering the non-optimized RDC design. We will use the data presented here as input for our proposed model. But first, it is necessary to verify that our keel probe method is comparable to thrust stand measurements. In order to do that, we are going to look at different published data, which can be converted to EAP and pressure gain using Camming and Paxson's method. We looked at this graph before, but now it also contains experimental data from Brophy and Codoni. It is also possible to collapse the two important area ratios into just one, the throat to injector area ratio. This was first proposed by Walters et al. and the graph then looks like this. Now what happens when we add our data to it? Let's again start with the idealized two-dimensional CFD results from Camming and Paxson, which can be overlaid with the trend line. Now we add experimental results from the Naval Postgraduate School's Hydrogen Air RDC, Purdue's Methane Air RDC, and the Air Force Research Lab's Hydrogen Air RDC. A Russian Hydrogen Oxygen Rocket RDC was described by Frolov. Then we have also more recent data from the Air Force Research Lab. Aerojet Rocketdyne tested a large-scale methane air RDC at Purdue. And finally, a high-fidelity numerical simulation of the NPS combustor conducted by the Naval Research Lab. Earlier results from our lab fall in the same trend. And if we overlay the current results, these do as well. Based on this graph, we can conclude that A, the data gathered with the keel probe is similar to that from thrust and experiments, and B, a general trend of pressure gain related to the area ratio appears. Based on these observations, we propose a model that captures the effects of varying injector area ratio, varying outlet throat area ratio, and the propellant mass flux. The model should further be linear in all terms. Higher order models are possible, but their predictive capabilities are less confident considering the trends presented earlier. We will split both alpha and beta into three parts, an offset and a linear relation to the respective area ratio. We then end up with a total of six coefficients that can be determined, for example, with an iterative least squares estimation. For this, we can now use our data set of more than 250 individual points. And these are the resulting coefficients. As a sanity check, we should expect alpha 2 to be positive and alpha 3 to be negative based on the definition of the associated area ratios. The term that is multiplied with the mass flux on the other hand should be positive, and that is indeed true. We can now check how well our model represents our own data set. This is done by comparing the actual measured value with the prediction from the model. The residual is plotted here as a function of the relative areas for the investigated mass flux range. We are able to predict the pressure gain value with a plus minus 0 0.06 accuracy. The R squared value of this fit is 95.7%. Taking this one step further, we took our model and applied it to Brophy and Codoni's data set from the Naval Postgraduate School without adjusting the coefficients. Their RDC, of course, differs significantly from the one at TU Berlin. Not only is it 70% larger in diameter, but it also features an axial air injection scheme. 
Here again we are plotting the difference between estimated and actual pressure gain over the relative areas. And we can see that although the residuals do increase slightly, this happens mostly for conditions which are extrapolated from our model. Those points are colored red. The black markers correspond to conditions that we covered in our experiment and there the model does an equally good job. This is a very positive result and also an invitation to the RDC community to increase this data set on which the model can be trained. Finally, we are interested in what the model tells us about where to expect actual positive pressure gain. In order to do so, we start with the best performing configuration with an air injector area ratio of 0.46, an outlet restriction of 0.5, and a propellant mass flux of 290 kg per second and square meter. We will move this point back to the plane of relative areas, recalling the region of interest that was shown earlier and from the experience of various experimental groups it is challenging to operate an RDC with similar injector and throat areas. This is mainly due to strong shock reflections and crosstalk between plenum and chamber. For us, that means that we would like to stay on the upper left side of this line. We can now use our model to scan for lines of constant pressure gain with this specific mass flux. These are here overlaid in gray with the threshold at which the pressure balance is zero in black. This now gives us the small region of geometric conditions for which a positive pressure gain can be expected. In reality, this window will be even smaller due to operability issues as the one-to-one -one line is approached. The other option is to increase the mass flux which shifts and rotates the lines of constant pressure gain. Based on our model, the mass flux necessary to just equalize the pressure balance would be 430 kg per second and square meter. It can already be seen that optimizing an RDC for best performance is a non-trivial task that requires a balance between a multitude of aspects. However, we are positive that our model, which incorporates three main drivers of stagnation pressure gain in RDC, captures, for now, the most relevant effects. It can and should be extended to various other RDC designs to better predict design corridors that lead to positive pressure gain and thus serves as a straightforward tool for the whole RDC community. Thank you. That concludes my talk.